Okay, um, so I'm happy to have this be pretty informal, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to just chime in and maybe we'll derail the discussion, but hopefully it's just as good. Um, that is, I think it's important to talk about things that people here are interested in or that people in here find like contentious or worth discussing and not the things that I guessed in advance that people here would find contentious or worth discussing. So I'm going to talk about cause prioritization. Uh, first I'm going to say a little bit about what I mean. So the basic problem we're trying to address is there's some ridiculous number of things one could do in the world in an effort to make the world better. Like one could work on education, or technology, or health, or development, or reducing corruption, or reducing war, etc. Um, the goal of cost prioritization is to understand the connection between the things we do, for example, invest in health infrastructure in the developing world, and the things we ultimately care about, which is something like human welfare, um, perhaps, or something like social flourishing, maybe some more, something more wacky. Um, and in the service of that goal, there are lots of different things we could do. The basic thesis I'm going to advance is that instead of investing in any of the particular altruistic endeavors we'll look promising today, uh, the best thing to invest in is probably, at least on the current margin, is probably research and understanding which of those opportunities are most effective. So this may be a thesis that's really uncontroversial with most people here, maybe it's a thesis most people will disagree with. Uh, I'm going to try and defend that claim. Um, so to start, I'm going to give some examples of research that I think is reasonable approach to reducing that uncertainty. The uncertainty about what happens between the interventions that we pursue and the things we ultimately care about. So one very straightforward example, if you're familiar with IPA or JPAL, is just empirical work that aims to understand the causal relationship between the things we're doing and intermediate indicators that we care about. So for example, if you're interested in distributing bed nets, one thing you can do is you can randomly distribute bed nets to half of the people, or randomly distribute bed nets to a village or whatever, and try and estimate the change in the burden of malaria. Um, you could also do like, a more econometrics work, not RCTs, but uh, correlational studies to try and understand the connection between various parameters you're interested in. So this is one sort of work that I think is pretty uncontroversial and helps improve our model of what happens after we intervene. So we distribute some bed nets we want to know what happens. Sorry, what's an RCT? Oh, sorry, RCT. Random control. Yeah, it's a randomized controlled trial, mm -hmm. so where you explicitly hold or vary something that you're interested in seeing the effect of. Uh, I have a question. Is that some sort of uh, the near, lately emerging developmental studies? Or? Yeah, IPA and JPAL both do um, empirical work on interventions in the developing world, or yeah. almost entirely in the developing world, to understand their effects. Is that the question? Uh, is that some connected to development studies as nearly emerging in uh, humanities? Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah. They use like lots of RCTs in like development studies. Yeah. How big are they? IPA and JPAL? Yeah. Uh, on the order of millions of dollars. It's a very crude estimate. So the second sort of work you can do that's perhaps slightly more controversial, but probably still pretty straightforward, is you can try and do theoretical work to understand that causal pathways from the things you do to the things you care about. So the IPCC would be one example of this. They have some system they care about that's really hard to inspect in the same way that you inspect bed nets. They care about what will happen in the climate on the basis of some intervention by existing people. Um, and so they sit down, they employ a bunch of climate scientists, and then try and do theoretical work that will inform predictions about what will happen in 50 years' time or 100 years' time. So here it's a little harder to come by robust knowledge. Right? You can't do an RCT or you can't do many RCTs exactly one, um, but this knowledge is still very useful if you're considering intervening on the climate, right? because you want to have some model of what's likely to happen as a result of your intervention. Uh, something that's substantially farther out there would be philosophical work to identify considerations that are particularly important on your values. So one example of this would be if one is like an aggregate utilitarian or something like this, it's sort of an important observation that events that happen in the future are pretty important, and something that might not be salient to if you don't sit down at some point and think, what are the important considerations? Which type of utilitarian? I, I just view of aggregative values uh, aggregate. in general. Like mm -hmm. think twice as much stuff is twice as important. Then you might think about how large the future is likely to be, and this might be a really important thing to think through, um, which can help make, end up making a big difference in what cause you want to support. Uh, yeah, I guess I have a fairly long list here. A fourth type is quantitative analysis, or fourth type of research. So this is taking considerations which people have already raised, or taking empirical work which people have done, and trying to see how those considerations stack up against each other quantitatively. Just sitting down and building quantitative models, sitting down and comparing the strength of various factors, trying to produce summaries of the sort that let you produce a judgment. 
It's a way of synthesizing what we know. So the Copenhagen consensus brings together experts in a number of subject areas uh, and then gets them to write papers on a position or on a type of intervention, for example, preserving biodiversity or developing world health, and then tries to come up with some quantitative estimate of how effective interventions in that category are likely to be, and then gets a panel of economists to rate them on the basis of that argument. So backing a little bit away from this quantitative synthesis, one could do a more qualitative synthesis. We could talk with people in different areas and try and understand what experts believe and why they believe it. Try and look at a wide variety of causes or interventions that people consider promising and understand what exactly they consider promising and why. So I'd consider GiveWell Labs to be a particularly successful or at least promising looking example of this so far. The last category I was going to mention are improvements in general forecasting. So if people are familiar with this IARPA project, um, there's just a bunch of questions about political events which they're interested in forecasting or they're interested in using as test cases for forecasting. They bring together a bunch of people and try and understand the conditions under which those people can make accurate predictions about things that will happen in a year's time or a couple of years' time. And so I think this is not perhaps directly germane to this question of what should you invest in to make the world better, but insofar as all of these things just depend on making correct predictions about the future, it's potentially a very important sort of knowledge to build up and one that you can there's not been much investment in this area, and so there are a lot of very straightforward opportunities to invest more dollars and end up with a better sense of how people can make predictions. Okay. This is a pretty random smattering of possible ways to make headway on this question, that is to reduce our uncertainty about the connection between what we do and what we care about. Uh, the time I spent on each one should be considered to be proportional to its importance, which is how much I had to say before it makes sense. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions about any of these things? We can also come back to them in a few minutes after. Um, the data was interesting. Uh, is Dagger one of the consortium, the consortia that participated in the IR? Yeah, so Dagger is one of the teams. The Good Judgment Project was another team. Those yeah. are the two with which I'm most familiar. Yeah. Dagger was the team um, from GMU using prediction markets. Yeah, I, I participated in, in the TEDLOC team, and it was an interesting exercise, but um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about Tetlock is although his method did very well in those trials, if, if you read his book, which I suspect you probably have, um, he gets to the end and says, well, I don't know what we can do about this except be like Hamlet. <laughs> Remember that? It's the strangest so, ending to his book. Yeah, so it's not clear. It is a hard problem. I think he's yeah. acknowledging it's a hard problem. But it's definitely the case that people haven't tried very much. And so it's a natural thing to do, which is to try a bunch of stuff to see what works and then try a bunch of stuff related to what's worked and iterate. And I think that's sort of what he's implementing. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like it's, yeah, it's not that much of a downer position necessarily. <laughs> um, all right, so here's a bunch of sorts of research that might be useful. Uh, might be useful to quickly recap what I see as the main places where this research has been done to date. Uh, so I think for some of the categories, there's been research in academia that addresses cost prioritization. So for example, within economics, you'll see a lot of research that tries to link various economic indicators to various inputs or economists might try and understand the effects of education in a particular domain, etc. Um, or in development studies, people might look at interventions and study them with RCTs, etc. Um, so one characteristic of this work, which is unfortunate from the philanthropist perspective, is that it tends to be unfocused. People tend not to be asking what is the very best thing we could do, and let's zoom our, like, focus all of our attention on the best things to do. And so if you're interested primarily in answering that question, your focus would be somewhat different. And so from your perspective, there's still some unanswered questions, there's still some low-hanging fruit. A second big category of work is cost prioritization that's been done by philanthropists so far. So a lot of people who've given away money, most of them have thought at least some about what they ought to give money to. A lot of foundations have done some amount of explicit research into what areas would be productive to spend their resources on. And a primary complaint with this work is that it's primarily been private. So if you look at a foundation, you can see what they're giving to. It's typically very hard to understand why they've made those decisions. But typically very, very hard to understand why they focused on the causes they focused even to understand why they focused on the particular charities they focused on is often quite difficult. So they don't make the methodologies transparent. Yeah. And it's not just like there's some selective club of billionaires where they all share their information within their club. It's like, it's quite difficult, even if one is running a foundation, to really engage in serious discussion with other foundations about their methodology or why they're doing it. And not impossible, but there certainly could be a large, yeah. things could be quite different. Make. What? One for the sociologists make. Indeed. <laughs> Do they just not consider it important to tell people 
Yeah, so I guess there are a bunch of things going on. One is that being transparent about your entire decision-making process is typically extremely difficult, sort of even to yourself. Uh, like when I decide to do a thing, it's actually pretty hard for me to be explicit about why I've decided to do the thing. And so that's one obstacle to making it transparent to other people. Uh, another is that it seems like a very uncomfortable thing to do, to expose your reasons for doing something, but I don't know if this is people's reasons. At this point, this is largely speculation. Mm -hmm. Another is that people, um, I guess there's one set of norms you could have for explaining what you're doing, and there's another, like the normal set of norms for explaining what you're doing doesn't involve giving a very useful explanation. It involves just saying some words about why it's good, but not considering in much depth, like why other things might be better, or why this is the best thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that means the sort of, when people do give explanations, the sort of explanations they give are typically not super helpful for, say, reproducing their decision. That's probably a, a, a general rule of critical thinking is that you know, people are very prone to saying, you know, such and such is good or such and such is bad, but seldom they ask questions from people with what. And, and that's the question that really encourage people to ask. So I guess another reason this is tough is that it's very uncomfortable to say that something is bad, or it's super frowned upon to say that something is bad typically. And making comparisons in an honest way seems to involve saying that this thing's not only good or not only excellent, but it's good relative to some other thing I could be spending my money on, or good relative to all of the things I could be spending my money on. It's something that's not super fun to do. I uh, guess, mo sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. I guess most philanthropists also just haven't thought that other people might be interested in their actual decision-making process as opposed to hearing just general reasons why it's good, which is usually what you assume people want to hear. Yeah, so I guess I'm mostly speculating about motives here. It's perhaps something I ought to know more about, or I'll have pressed more people on. Is it, is it that the decision-making process is in flux, because they're continually trying to improve on it internally, um, and don't have the resources to sort of uh, explain that in plain English? It could be very mathematical, right? You know, you try and talk to a continental philosopher about some of the deepness of AI, and some of them just won't get it. They'll speak completely different dialects. And, all of a sudden, you find yourself in the uh, the Tower of Babel. And part of this would be an optimistic explanation. I don't know if it's a true explanation. <laughs> but uh, it strikes me that one of the constraints could be, as I understand it, from talking to John Fitzgerald, who I mentioned earlier, is that um, foundations are obliged, to, at least in the US, and I would assume here, uh, to donate its 5 percent of their capital. Each That's year. Right. So the, a certain amount of money they have to give away. So in the US, you have to donate 5%, but the notion of donate is somewhat broad. So if I run a foundation and I employ someone to do research into what causes are good to donate to, that, that counts as my 5%. Mm -hmm. um, so basically anything I'm spending towards a philanthropic end is, counts as my 5%. Right. Or even if I invest in an enterprise which I expect to um, benefit the world or to comply with my mission statement, it counts. But if you're a big foundation like the Gates Foundation, that's a lot of money, 5% of yeah. your capital. That's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be employing a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you say that all this secrecy sometimes raises suspicion, especially in post-colonial countries that sometimes undermine their causes? I don't know. As far as the theories. I would expect that what's going on is not secrecy per se. It's more just sort of takes effort. Yeah. Um, and it's not clear. It's not clear from your perspective as a condition if there are really people paying attention that justify that effort. Um, so I don't know if when... It's plausible not being more explicit about what you're doing is bad for your cause. Yeah. Certainly one reason could be bad beyond the one you mentioned is that it makes it harder for other people to understand what you're thinking or to therefore contribute. Um, I'd be very afraid of criticism. Like yeah. if all the foundations are putting out their reasoning, you put yours out there and everyone's comparing it and saying, well, they're making it better, you should do what they're doing. And yeah. That could be like unpleasant if you spent six months researching what to do and then everything just rates. And Paris thought you should learn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like if you cared about doing the best good, yes. You, you, you go through that. But a lot of foundations have kind of this, this momentum, like, the, the, you know, of having kind of invested in a particular cause, and they would feel afraid that they'd lose all their funding if they decided they're going to change direction once they've already put a lot of capital in a particular direction. So. Yeah, I think it's easy to supply a lot of plausible psychological motivations, like a lot of reasons why things might be this way. Mm -hmm. The most important point from our perspective is this means that if you're interested in contributing to like, this public base of knowledge about what is a good thing to do, or about considerations that are generally relevant to making that decision, there seems to be a lot of room to do that. Mm -hmm. Even if people have invested quite a lot, they mostly haven't invested it in a way that's building on itself or in a way that's created a publicly useful base of knowledge. Has anyone actually tried asking people, like these foundations and so on, and just saying, what is your methodology for picking and how did you get here? Yeah, this has certainly been, yeah. yeah. So okay. I guess the main source of that um, would be GiveWell's working with Good Ventures. Okay. Good Ventures, it's, a, it's not a huge, but a reasonably large foundation. 
and they're, they're trying to engage with other foundations as much as they can. Cool. Um, apart from that, yeah, so I have some random contact with foundations and pushed a few people on this. Um, I can talk about that in more like. Uh, so the third category, I guess all six of the organizations that I gave as examples before uh, were explicit or projects explicitly pointed at this problem of how do you find out or how do you resolve this uncertainty about whether the thing you're doing is good? How do you find out what is the most good? And my main complaint with that work is just that there's not much of it. So the total investment in that area has not been very large, has been, say, less than 0.1% of philanthropic spending, which is quite a small amount. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, so in terms of like international aid, you have to look at kind of the politics behind it as well. So what actually drives like overseas development assistance isn't necessarily to do the most good. It's to make your country more popular overseas and um, to create uh, relationships of dependency on the receiving economy. So they have to buy all the products from your, your society. Aid so is definitely direct support for your own economy. Aid is definitely a more complicated story, I think, than private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, and even private philanthropy is not that straightforward. I think it would be wrong to imagine the philanthropist as someone who's like sitting back and then thinking like their sole objective is to do the most good. Um, yeah. Which is why their plight is so secretive. Uh, this is, again, another psychological motive. <laughs> Robin Henson would certainly go with some theory of the form, I think, I suspect. <laughs> Surprising if he didn't have a blog post, philanthropy isn't about helping, or charity isn't about helping. I'm sure there are at least I think he literally has a post, charity isn't about helping, probably. I just want to let people know who Robin Hansen is, and yeah. everyone here to play with him. Robin Hansen is an economist, and Katya blogged alongside him. Um, very interesting ideas. Uh, he also uh, founded Overcoming Bias, which is a website about, I guess, building on cognitive science understanding why our minds do certain things that they do and how they're not helpful. We might want to be aware of them and overcome them. And he was doing that with Elias Yudkowsky and that grew, split off and became less wrong, which is um, another group of us here who's meeting for this purpose. You mean Yudkowsky split off and found yeah. less wrong? Yeah, yeah I think he was, he was uh, the original less wrong posts he was making were on overcoming bias, like alongside Robin Hansen. Um, Robin Hansen is also a pioneer of prediction markets. Of what? Prediction markets. He was involved in an American government you know, um, project a while back which failed because of politics. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a famous story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his writings are very wide ranging, very interesting. Yeah. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look. Is that Ian or Owen? Owen. 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 Uh, so the upside from successful or successes in cost prioritization, just that there's very little public discourse about, or very little serious, responsible public discourse about which things are best, or which interventions will have any particular effect on the world, and there's quite a lot of spending. You could imagine that quite a lot of resources can be diverted based on a better understanding. Uh, even if a very small fraction of resources are really trying to seek what appears to be the best opportunity to do good, that can still be quite a lot of money. Um, and quite a lot of good. Yeah. That's the hope. Okay, is it like 8.05 now or something? Take your time. Uh, it's 2 to 8. 2 to 8, mm -hmm. cool. Um, I don't think anyone's getting bored yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have this complicated looking tree, uh, but really at this point I've just been interested in talking about things that people here find like most interesting about this claim. And maybe that everyone here, so I guess a question would be, Amongst the people here, if you had a dollar to give, um, who would find it compelling to give to someone doing research on questions of this form as compared to someone doing distributing bed nets or someone pushing on technological progress or someone enacting our current best um, current best guess? It all depends on the the <laughs> your values and whether they are, those values are actually um, well, effective do or not. not. I mean, if, you're, if, if you value that you should put up as many lake supermarkets in the Western world as possible, 
um, then that may be your form of altruism and someone else's form of altruism is um, distributing bad nets or, you know, working on friendly AI. Well, the, so yeah, the most interesting group of people for this discussion is the group which cares neither about distributing bed nets nor about building supermarkets, but the group which cares about some further thing in the world which can be affected by distributing bed nets or building supermarkets. Mm. And so I guess I don't actually know. Yeah, it's hard to feel or to figure out what exactly the views of people in the room are, but it'd be interesting for the perspective of directing future conversation at least. It was not worth the effort trying to figure it out. There's also some caveats I'm going to have to say before actually asking. Yeah, yeah just to yeah. that if you were going to give money to people who were distributing bed nets, you'd want to know that they were doing it effectively. Which means the prior question is, how do you get the prioritization right? You know, how do you know that, that they're doing it well or that there isn't something better that they could do? But equally, if you're going to give the money to people doing the core prioritization, you'd want to be confident that, that they were doing it well and that it would lead somewhere. So there are prior, prior concerns. Yes, there could be this infinite stack of regrets. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Actually, you know. on that point, I was actually going to say that it seems like there's a, a sort of a higher priority thing again. For me personally, and my pleasure doing other individual personally, which is that um, it seems like the, the highest value ex expenditure of my own resources right now is to invest in my own information about what I'm going to be most have the greatest competitive advantage. And so, you know, choosing between whether I try and earn to give and find some area where I can earn less money versus whether I have skills that are more applicable to doing direct help, um, you know, like doing direct working for this sort of good, you know. I think in both these cases, I think it's not going to be trivial to argue that, it's not going to be trivial at all to argue that it's better to think about what things are best to do than just do our current best guess. And similarly, I think it's not going to be trivial to advance, to argue that it's better to go up one meta level or to first think about what I should do with my career. But, so I guess my view would be, like, when you can actually make that argument, then that's a compelling reason to go up one meta level until you like, can't make that argument anymore. Right. Or can't think, successfully make that argument uh, anymore. I think it's really important to each kind of need each other in the sense that if you don't have the research for what to prioritize and then um, try and prioritize, you're not going to be able to. And if you want to donate um, and then not have any idea of what is better to use your money for, then so they, they kind of depend on each other in a sense. And I would also assume that the amount of research that you can do, um, so say an organization has X percentage doing research, it's they're not going to be able to employ all of their organization to be doing um, exponentially good research. There's going to be kind of like a, a level off kind of point where at, I would I would assume that it'd be better to just use the funds to the research that they've done. Yeah. So I guess one general issue is going to be that for either for any sort of investment, there are diminishing returns. And so in general, it's not going to be there's the best option because as you invest in that option, it becomes worse and worse relative to alternatives. Right. So the real question is. What is the best option on the current margin? Like the total amount of money say, that we're considering donating now, or people in this room are currently considering donating, um, is perhaps not super large. Like it's not large compared to the total budget that might be invested over the next year in figuring these things out. Well, that, that would, I guess, highly depend on the percentage uh, chance of the research. You know, like how effective is that research compared to how, like, how do we, how do you measure that? Yeah. So the the hope from the amount of money being small is that we can say like what is true on the current margin. And so the best thing for a person to do is not going to be you know, split your money half and half, but to just say, on the current margin, this thing looks like a really good right. thing to invest in. So just put my $1,000 or whatever in that direction. Yeah. I mean, on the face of it, course prioritization is economics 101, right? There's an indefinite number of things you could put money into. How do you determine which ones? And it's a very basic, a very fundamental, basic seeming problem. Yeah. 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 And Raise up. It seems did you have a question? I had a comment on the decision where I give the dollar for the next or the research. Yeah. I think it would be like based on the results I thought that the research group was going to get. Mm. If they seemed well connected or they had a marketing plan or somehow I could see that they were going to act on what they found. Uh, if I couldn't see that really clearly, then the direct, direct result of the next, I know that would be helping someone. That, that would be that's my metric. Yeah. So it seems you've really got to like estimate three numbers. You've got to estimate the probability of success, the magnitude of success, and your discount rate when you start looking at research things that are going to have effects that way in the future. Um, so you really need to start like making estimates for those, and then you know using cause prioritization research to refine those estimates and so on. Or like you know, effectiveness estimates to refine the you know numbers for how effective the malaria nets are going to be. But it seems like a lot of the ground level things like malaria nets and so on are sort of um, for every marginal dollar you give, you've got a fairly high probability of having a fairly small effect. Whereas for the research things, you're looking at a distant, large effect that has a much lower probability of panning out and being significant. 
check on. So you sort of got to try it on that. Yeah, a, a good question is not super simple. How do you know that research has got a higher probability of having a larger effect? Well, like, you know, if you can, so let's say cause prioritization research mm -hmm. discovers, you know, cause X has this, you know, huge scope for marginal improvement, and it's like 20% better than all the other causes. You channel 20% of, you know, how many million dollars a year in donations there. That's a very much larger effect than giving, you know, if you know that. Yeah, yeah I know, but this is the thing. Like, the plausible benefits, you've got to estimate this, and we don't know, which is why it's a different question. Well, one, one way that, you know, you could get a really rough estimate about the value of information from investing is, like, you look at the distribution of all the different costs that are invested now, and, like, say, across GiveWorlds, you know, research, I believe there's, like, orders of magnitude difference in how much, of, how effective different costs that have investigated are, right? Yeah. Well, I think they would probably say that over time, if they're looking to things more, those gaps have tended to vanish. It tends to look at face value like there's some large gap in effectiveness, and there's just a lot of considerations that tend to push things closer oh, really? to average. Okay, but at any rate, you can, you can look at what? Not that. Oh no, it tends to tends to get shaved off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like the differences between give wells top three charities are much smaller than the difference between pick random charity X that the government donates to and give wells top third, you know, third charity or something. Right, but that's that's what I was saying. Like, so of the of the worst charities and the best charities in the world, there's probably always a magnitude difference in how effective they are at doing, you know, what most humans would consider good. And if you just, you know, look across that distribution, you might be able to use that to kind of project, you know, how likely it is that we'd find, you know, orders of magnitude more than anything we know about. As in, so, you know, if there's, if there's some non-trivial chance of finding something that's like, you know, a hundred times as good as the best thing is currently known, then you could figure out, you know, roughly how uh, much expectability they have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm the manager. <laughs> right. I'm opinion here. I don't imagine it. It feels like the best thing would just be to buy BetNet. So, yeah, on the grounds that, what, what's the likelihood? Is it really likely that we'll find a better cause with the thousand dollars? Or, or well, I mean, it may not be a thousand dollars. The amount of money here, from, yeah. with a hundred million dollars or something like this. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at how much um, Get Give Well specifically has made progress in, you know, how effective they think. Like so, every time people find a new charity which is you know more effective than the last one they had, you can kind of look at the progression of how good the best charity that Give Wells is recommending is. Well, that's a and super depressing list. Is it? Yeah. I mean, just like because it's going the wrong direction. Oh really? <laughs> As I mean, in, Give Wells had a lot of money in the first, but like because this wasn't done too much. Sure. But in the main, the main issue with Give Wells recommendations is if you're tracking like our expected quality of the recommendations, then just as you get better informed, your estimates seem to typically Four. go down. Yeah, just something you expect by um, like the winner's curse. Then, then they're going down relative to... Yeah, they're, they're getting better. Yeah. But if you like plot a graph of our estimate for the best thing over time, it's, mm. uh, it's dropping. Oh, right. So, so Paul, does this become a question of uh, what fraction of your dollar should you spend on the best identified <coughs> cause to date versus continuing future research? <laughs> Would you would you argue that this is a a binary uh, consideration? Either put all your money into research or put all your money into the, the best known thing. So I think if you had a community of like many people who are making these decisions and probably the same way as you, then you would expect to end up splitting your dollar. Basically, you expect you're at some equilibrium where you're investing basically the right amount in each. And if you add an extra dollar, that's going to shift the balance. Like as you invest in this one, it's going to be worse, and then you have to invest in this one. Until, um, I think if you're in a situation where either people disagree quite a lot about values, or where there's like some smart money and a lot of not smart money, um, then what you expect is more, when you look at the world as it is, there's some place where given your values, there's the highest bang for your buck, and you want to invest a large share of your money. There might be other considerations, but just on the basis of impact, you want to invest mostly in one thing. Is there an obvious way when to stop doing meta research and just to, to pick the best cause and go with it? Ah, so intuitively, what you'd like to do is you'd like to have some high enough standard for argument that you ought to go meta, such that you keep doing research until you can no longer justify doing such research. So it seems like splitting the dollar wouldn't necessarily be the most uh, effective thing to do if you have you know X return on the research. Um, it doesn't make sense to have half of that dollar going into research if you only need 20 cents. Uh, yeah, so once you've done the research, like once there's sort of no more low-hanging research to be done, once returns to just have fallen a lot, then you want to shift your money away. But my point is, like, say it costs, um, say you have, you know, $100 million, and you figure out that there's only $20 million that needs to be allocated to research, and anything else put into it is just not effective. Yeah. So there is, like, a cap at, at research. Yeah, so that's where this 
like if we want to just make this as a binary yes or no thing. Pending <laughs> such research, the other 80 million will be wasted. So that's the real dilemma, isn't it? I mean, but if we use so if we use the small assum the assumption that your amount of money is quite small compared to the amount of money involved in doing research. Like if I'm a donor who's giving a thousand dollars or something, it's sort of unlikely I'm going to pass that point as I'm giving my thousand dollars. So imagine giving away dollar one and then giving away dollar two. Right. I'm I'm just I'm just targeting more kind of higher end philanthropy in the sense that you have a lot of these corporations that have enough money to actually uh, cap out the research. I guess, like, aside from the Gates Foundation, almost no, like, individual donations going to drop the marginal benefit. Um, I think a lot of assholes. probably if you look at a short time scale, there really is pretty steeply diminishing returns to dollars, right? So if you, like, look, you know, GiveWell, let's say, right now, suppose you thought GiveWell was the best bet for doing this research. GiveWell has some funding shortfall it's projected. They actually, I think, have a pretty small funding shortfall projected for next year. It's like $100,000 or something like this. Yeah. And they're trying to get $800,000 so that they'll have enough assets they feel comfortable sitting on them. Um, so if you think GiveWell is substantially better than the next best bet and you sort of believe GiveWell, this is really how much they want to spend, they don't want to spend more, then they have a big drop down at that point. Um, but even that is pretty large compared to the average donor, at least. Like when I'm making my giving decisions for the year, it's fairly small compared to get close funding shortfall. Yeah. I was just wondering, hypothetically, if the world just embraced effective altruism and then just be massive flex swings of where the funding would go, how do you take into account like existing charity infrastructure? Like these existing organizations have these channels set up. Yeah. So that's really like you know, if some infrastructure is sitting there and it needs like labor to actually make use of the infrastructure, then as funding, in that, I, mean, I guess there's two ways you could look at it. One is from the sort of ideal perspective. As funding for that thing drops, then eventually you have this infrastructure that's underutilized, and so the value of funding it becomes quite large. That's from sort of an ideal perspective. Probably in practice, you wouldn't want to actually cut funding. Like There's something to be said for these other considerations. Like It's really valuable for organizations to have steady streams of funding. So it's reasonable to just, like, even if you're not totally sure if it's the most cost-effective thing anymore, you should continue giving until it seems really quite likely you should swap away. Or so should effective altruists be phrasing that we're trying to create more people being altruistic and then figuring out where the new funding will be going? Um, yeah, so I guess there might be some difference if you switch from like, there's diverting existing funding and there's adding new funding. And in some sense, the adding new funding problem is slightly easier in that you don't have to deal with this like organizations are relying on money in order to keep operating and so on. There might be other costs in moving funding away from things. I don't know if it's really a key issue. Yeah. But what about in terms of something like now that Against Malaria Foundation is no longer number one, um, that's going to be a huge like, flux of money moving away from there. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if they, so the situation with the Against Malaria Foundation is that they currently have a reasonably large amount of money. Mm -hmm. And if they finalize a net distribution, and they will become the number one recommendation again, I would guess. Um, from GiveWell. So it's sort of like they don't have money right now, they have less money than expected, they definitely don't have any idle infrastructure waiting for money. It's more like they have, yeah, they have some assets that they're, I guess, not sitting on, but not using for net distributions at the moment. So they're not in the situation where moving money away will actually co create a significant cost. I mean, this, that's exactly what you want to have. I mean, this is just the market of programming. If, you know, as you said, everyone did, you know, suddenly become rational, effective altruists, so we had reasonably good information, then it would all be the yeah, and that's easier on the upside than the downside. Like it's easier to keep giving to something until the returns drop and just take money away until they go up, I guess. But yeah. It's the same principle either way. There's a rather detailed um, article I haven't quite made it all the way through on whether or not you should split uh, your donations or just donate to one charity on the giving what we can blog. And I'll I'll put that on the on Facebook, on various groups, people can find it. Quite a look at it. it makes the case that you shouldn't, and it lists about I think, five reasons of quite detailed considerations, economic, all very pertinent to this. It's interesting, it sounds like an old calendar of in a casino. Should you <laughs> use your money in, in, in small groups or put it all down? That's probably where they got their basic. <laughs> <problem. laughs> well, the case and for dividing money between well, there yeah. Um, so I guess one other caveat related to splitting donations, which I really wanted to make before asking anyone what their current view was, is that if you're trying to donate to figure out what the best thing to do is, there is certainly something to be said for investing in things that are plausible guesses. And investing in an activity is often an important part of evaluating activities in that space. Like if you want to test like a net distribution, it's quite good to be actually distributing nets. 
And conversely, as an or like as a movement, effective altruism has a related problem where if they want to be like if the standards that effective altruists are using to make decisions are to be taken seriously, it's m much better if there's actually money being directed according to those standards at the moment instead of merely the promise that in 10 years' time money will be directed according to those standards. So I think even if you buy the argument entirely that the thing to be doing right now is research, one is still going to be giving some money at the object level. One is going to be spending some money on things just so that these standards are in fact directing money and so that you can be doing research which relies on actually engaging with the problems to be solved in that way. So if you believe you have information about a cause being important, that there are no existing companies like, like Big Kid Wells that uh, like have it in their scope to research, um, then does it make sense to invest resources personally into that domain so that there is more knowledge available to, to judge its value? Yes, I guess my view on this would be on the basis of arguments like the one I haven't made, that's been implicitly made here, that if you like a cause to which people aren't looking at much right now, you'd like to invest in people looking at that cause. Like if you're but doesn't that go with actually doing research into the cause directly so that you can do research? Yeah, so that, will, exactly. that will depend on the nature of the cause, but for many things it will be necessary to actually do some of it in order to evaluate how good it was. Or it's yeah. often enough easier to evaluate something in retrospect that the best approach is to do some of it and then evaluate how good it was than to evaluate a priori before you've done any how good it will be. And it varies across causes to how yeah. Yeah. Um, I suffer with like this issue where I try and figure out how effective my money is going to be now compared to how I can scale my money in the future. Like, what would you say as as far as a personal uh, finance situation? Um, if you have the opportunity to invest the money um, for a larger impact later than actually even give to research or a cause, um, like, a la, like Warren Buffett or something. Yeah, so this is a complicated issue, certainly. So it depends a bit on what sort of opportunities are available to you. Right. If there's a distinction between someone who's like investing in their own human capital and has access to some business opportunity where they can reasonably expect to make returns that are perhaps above the market, and someone who's just considering like, putting money in the S&P 500. Um, my guess would be, in general, the main reason to wait is if you just think you don't know a great thing to invest in right now, um, and you expect to know something much better in the future. Good wait. <laughs> And then how do you kind of determine that it's really sticky? Yeah, so if you're not getting any information, like, so if you're just sitting on money and investing it, it's not clear how you're getting information. If you have some source of information that's exogenous, where you feel like you really will be better informed in the future, right. then it begins to make sense to save. If you don't have any such source, like if the only way you're getting information is by actually doing things, then sort of one might as well go ahead and do things. I think there's a reasonable argument to be made for just saving and taking market interest rates, because market interest rates are really, are probably still quite high compared to growth rates. So I think. I think one can argue for that, and I find it pretty tempting. So I don't think it's very bad to save and wait, personally. I think market interest rates are quite quite competitive with the rates of return for altruistic investments and potentially larger. So we focus on, on finding avenues for direct impact and then funding them when it becomes clear that they're uh, a good cause. What about funding um, the sort of the higher level, the meta level causes about generating more interest in these ideas of effective altruism potentially, or of, uh, of, of educating people uh, and trying to spread these ideas more widely. So it, is there a danger there of investing too much or too little into meta causes versus direct causes? Yeah, so in principle, the trade-off you're making there is if we invest some dollar, I guess if you're referring specifically to charities where you get more uh, altruistic resources, you invest a dollar now, you get two dollars of altruistic resources in some years' time. Then the question is really, like, are you correctly assessing that? And if you're correctly assessing that, then you often take that opportunity while you have it. It seems often quite muddy because you say, like, you invest a dollar now, you get two dollars of altruistic resources in the future, but altruistic resources are not really fungible with each other. Right? There's sort of your dollars that you control, and you have a certain set of values. And maybe there's dollars that someone else is spending, and you convince them of some, or, you know, someone has convinced them of something that you endorse. But it's still not clear if they're going to be investing in the thing that you would invest in. So my current guess, and this is unrelated to the argument I'm making here, which isn't going to speak to the distinction between um, like outreach and research. But my current best guess is that research is a better thing to do at the moment, just because it increases the effectiveness of outreach considerably. Like I said, that's unrelated to the argument that I'm more confident in that I'm standing behind here. That would be a different discussion, which I guess I'm also happy to have. Was that was that a recommendation to uh, research better ways to do outreach? Uh, no, it's to have a better understanding of what we're doing in influencing the world, as an, in if only as an instrumental tool to, like, therefore, persuading people to do it, or persuading people to be enthusiastic about this project and influence the world more effectively. I think there, there's room for reasonable disagreement about that claim.
I guess I have a counter or a question. Like, if we assume that this this was the group of people in Melbourne that would fund research or effective altruism, if all of us went and tried to uh, recruit one friend this year, so the next year it was twice as big, there'd then be twice as much money for research. So maybe I think if you can spend a year and recruit someone who's just like yourself, that's like. If they would not otherwise have done anything useful, you can call them anything useful, then that's uh, probably a slam dunk. And yeah. my position is just skepticism about the plausibility of doing that. But I think for, like, if you're looking for advantage... There'd be a lot more people, so maybe that's something worth looking into. How many people is it worth and spending time to reach out to? Yeah. So the Center for Effective Altruism in Oxford takes basically this view that at the moment the most effective thing to do is to convince more people to engage in basically the same projects they're engaging in. Um, mm. Yeah, and so I think it's a point on which reasonable people can disagree. So you, you're saying that the Centre for Effective Altruism is arguing that the greatest priority should be to persuade people who are already giving charities to give more? Um, or to persuade, I guess, so the main audience are mostly young people who are deciding what to do with their careers. Right. And I take people who would otherwise pursue a career doing sort of a randomly chosen thing from that you know, population and instead get them to spend some significant fraction of their energies either doing research that's useful or doing outreach or thinking about these things uh -huh. or earning and having specifically in mind the idea of being part of a community where they discuss what to give to, etc. Uh -huh. it, it, has the Senate done any study which, for example, takes the methodology of, uh, of Lombok and uh, you know, his colleagues, looks at what's being done by the biggest foundations at the moment and, and says, well, you know, if we had their money and we really wanted to get the greatest impact, uh, we'd do it differently. Here's how. Has anybody done that kind of comparative study? So, in some sense, this is what all, like, and GiveWell is doing something which addresses basically the same question, but they have a different methodology. In some sense, it's exactly what the Copenhagen Consensus is doing, what the yeah. Copenhagen Consensus Center is doing. Um, in some sense, the Center for the Effective Altruism is spending some small fraction of the resources on that. So some people are addressing that problem, at least. Most of them are not using, other than the Copenhagen Consensus Center, most of them are not using the same methodology as the Copenhagen Consensus Center. I think the Center for Effective Altruism may have recommended funding the Copenhagen Census Center. Um, I'm not certain of that, though. Uh, considering it. I'd like to hear the argument for cost prioritization. I mean, why can't you say that Goodwill seems like a bunch of smart chaps will follow their recommendation? Uh, I mean, I don't know what Goodwill. So Goodwill doesn't want to recommend Goodwill. This argument would suggest uh, if you buy their smart chaps, they do have a. <laughs> I think they, they still have a $800,000 fundraising gap, or they'd like to raise $800,000. Um, but yeah, I guess that uh, you take the recommendation seriously that they do seem to be recommending particular object level interventions. I think that's largely because they're taking this view where to learn more one has to also be giving to things. Yeah, right. Or in order to learn more one wants to be like actually making recommendations and trying to sell those recommendations to people. Um, but they really And also it seems like quite a lot of hubris to recommend yourself as the best okay. charity in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That'll turn people off. Like, we're the best charity in the world, donate to us. And we'll yeah. decide for you what the best charity in the world is, which is us! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Latin, you going to say something? Uh, it's, it's just um, asking, is it better, possibly better to hire uh, expert uh, social scientists to do the research versus uh, asking young people to learn? Because as, as I said, that learning social science research skills probably going to take some time. Yeah, I think in general it makes sense to, if you have a sort of research you'd like done, uh, find people who are experts at doing that sort of research and have them do it. I think that's generally a solid recommendation for getting research done. Uh, I just want to add one real quick thing. Uh, it's all very relative as well. If you think about everyone's different um, access to resources, uh, I know you know certain friends of mine have certain access to resources that I don't, and vice versa. Uh, so understanding what exactly you individually can do or have access to is, I think, a really high priority in figuring out what the most effective thing is you personally can do. So I think money is an interesting case in that money is unusually fungible between different um, applications. With respect to things like human capital, I think it's a huge consideration, but like, or like other kinds of capital which are less fungible across different causes. Right, but that's I mean you can take resources that, so with money, you can take money which would be spent on problem X and you can substitute it to spending it on problem Y quite easily. Right, and also um, if like you have someone with you know much more money than say you know someone else doesn't have access to that. I mean, I think in general a smaller donor should pretty much always ex well. So I guess people would disagree about this. I would say that a smaller donor should pretty much always expect to get more bang for their buck than a larger donor. 
should should expect that is to say should seek to yes. or should expect in that it's likely if I'm giving a thousand dollars I hope to have an effect much larger than one millionth of someone who's giving a billion dollars I think that's very disappointing if I can't do that um, so like I guess one way of making the most pessimistic case for this which I think is something you should never do which illustrates the point is that if I have a thousand dollars I can like go to the roulette table and like put my thousand dollars on red and then walk away with two thousand dollars or zero dollars and repeat this a few times until I either have a billion dollars or nothing and I have a billion dollars with basically a probability of one in a million and then I can spend my billion dollars in the same way I would have if I was a billion dollar donor and then I've had one millionth the effect of a billion dollar donor I'm still not quite clear what you mean by having a greater effect if you've got a thousand dollars to donate you want it to have some effect now I've had either a very large effect or no effect. You want to, yeah. This is, this, is, this is about the fact that there's diminishing returns on free will of any cause, and so a large donor is going to use up the high highest margins before, you know... Um, yeah, in general, if you're a large donor, you have to put in a lot of effort in figuring out what the next good thing to give is to is, and that's right. very hard. And if you're a smaller donor, you have to do less of that. Is what you're saying, it's easy to spend $1,000 really well, but it's to spend a billion dollars really well. So there are other difficulties with spending $1,000 really well. And I guess this is like part of the problem that GiveWell wants to address. Right? Like the point of GiveWell, in some sense, or one of the original motivations, was to allow a bunch of people who each had $1,000 to give, or some small amount of money to give, to like pool together, and then behave as if they were collectively a large foundation. Um, but it's not to say that the person with a billion dollars is any less effective than $1,000, if not. Well, billion dollars is clearly going to be more. It's per dollar, is the point. Like, right, but yeah, the effectiveness per dollar. Like, you can forget altruism and just think of this in terms of finance. It's why there are no hedge funds that make 10% returns on a trillion dollars. Because you can't find enough causes to get 10% returns with, with a trillion, if you've got a trillion dollars to spend. If you're, uh, yes, I can basically make 10% returns on a thousand dollars. Yeah, just quite easily. Sitting yeah, at Because, um, yeah. yeah the other thing um, you were talking before about, um, uh, you know, different people having different attributes, that's the sort of old economic idea of comparative advantage of working out. It's important not just what you're good at, but what's already being done and how many other people are good at that thing and how that is all that thing is. So you sort of go away more. I mean, it's quite complicated, but yeah. So I guess this case, which I originally alluded to, and I probably shouldn't run through, I think we should probably, should we keep talking until dinner or should we break for discussion prior to dinner? How close is dinner? Um, <laughs> Oh, well, okay. Okay, discussion. Uh, good. Yeah, discussion is great. How far, like, any more slides? Do you have like, topics? Oh, I have a lot of slides. The presentation is not intended to go through all the slides. It is intended to go through some of them. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's yeah. go into this argument. So the argument I was going to make, it's just going to be basically a way of organizing the relevant considerations. It's going to be a very straightforward argument each step. So the first step, I want to argue that one, by investing modest amounts in cause prioritization, let's say on the order of $100 million, one can identify causes that are predictably have a significantly higher impact than our current best guess. So by significantly higher impact, let's say 10% more good than our current best guess. And this will be an easier discussion if I fix some values, um, like if I fix something you care about in the world. And I'm basically going to talk from the perspective of someone who's concerned with human welfare. Um, it will work basically the same if you're concerned with animal welfare. Um, it'll work basically the same if you're an agri-utilitarian. But I'm just going to fix that for concreteness. Okay, so the first part of the first claim is that we can identify with modest investment causes that are significantly better than our current best guesses. The second claim is that the value of identifying causes that are significantly better than our current best guesses is very large. So in particular, it's a significant fraction of like all philanthropic investment. So I want to say something like we invest $100 million today, we get out like $200 million of value. I think that's very conservative. So I guess one way of splitting up this discussion now is to ask which side of this is more interesting or more disagreeable. That is, do we think that with $100 million investment in a decade, we can find a cause that is 10% better than our current best guess, or a set of causes that can soak up a billion dollars of funding, which are 10% better than our current best guesses? I find the first one like a more interesting claim to explore. OK. Do we have any votes for finding significantly more um, impactful causes is very valuable. Wait, hang on. Votes in what we agree with or what we would like to discuss? Yeah, what you'd like to discuss. So presumably what you disagree with. Yeah. Okay. Or what you disagree with as opposed to... It is actually possible to find causes which are significantly more effective than our current best guesses. Okay, votes for the first one on the left. Second okay. one. Okay. 
Looks like one went. Right? Yeah. So what's the difference? Of so. Okay. So I guess I want to break this up again into two pieces. One is that there exist much better interventions to be found, and that is interventions which we can know to be much better. And the second is that we should expect that hundreds of millions of dollars is enough money that with pretty good probability we're actually going to stumble across those interventions. We're actually going to acquire the evidence which could convince us that those interventions are significantly better. Um, so votes for the left half versus the right half. So the first versus the second. For first? Like a story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I won the game. The first was? The first was that there exists causes that are substantially better. So we, which we can know to be yeah, substantially true, better. False, but yeah. yeah, if you think this claim is false, raise your hand. Or like, if you want to disagree with the claim. So we're knowing that there are causes now that are better than future causes. Yeah. Okay. If you want to disagree with that or discuss yeah. it further, that are a lot better and which we can know to be predictably better. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it's kind of a really almost impossible question because we don't know what kind of causes are going to elude from the future. That's right. So we have to make some guess as to whether investment is reasonable on the basis of our guess about whether or not such causes are likely to exist. No, what I'm arguing is we should expect them to exist, what so, I would argue. So I guess my argument would argue that there's a lot of causes now that won't exist in the future um, if we proceed to keep improving, say, like poverty. Um, uh, if it's growing at a substantial rate, like Bill Gates predicts, you know, poverty is going to be gone by 2035. Uh, so as in terms of like poverty, it seems like it would be more effective to donate now than to donate in the future when it doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah, so this is, you may think that we could discover causes that are much better, like in the world of today, that are much better than our current best guesses in the world of today, but yeah. the world of tomorrow will be so much better off that it's sort of immaterial. Right, that would be inspiring. Um, so I already cut you off at the last decision point. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but what's the relationship between those two considerations? You know, to what extent, if a large number of us said, why donate today? Because things are going to be so much better in 20 years. Well, there might be fewer opportunities, like for example, one thing I might think would change over the next 20 years is I might think that in 20 years there's going to be like a hundred billion dollars of super smart philanthropy yeah. and there'll be a bunch of philanthropists looking out for the best thing to do and all of the looking fruit, all of the really good things to invest in will get eaten up. Yeah. And I so like today I have this opportunity to, and tomorrow I won't. I think that's going to explain the difference. Um, imagine we're doing path finding. So I want to calculate the most optimal route to get from A to B. Um, and I currently have a route that looks kind of good. So there are two questions. One, does it ever exist? Two, can I find it? No. Can I find it with reasonable computing power? Uh, so I think the right is, can I find it? And the left is, does it exist? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Bring both for left. One of you, one interesting oh. scenario to explore here. Hi. Um, like interesting scenario to explore here with regard to like you know whether uh, if poverty is going to be eliminated kind of soon anyway, and the future is going to look better, then um, you know that sort of thing initially looks like well we should try and just make the poverty be eliminated sooner. But if your comparison is between you know um, fixing poverty earlier versus starting early on a threat which you know is posed to the whole human race, then if you know we want to we want to actually know what's going to be um, the, the best of two different routes that do good right now. So like, I'm going to explain that very well. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can anyone like articulate something better? <laughs> if, if Gates is right, and we're doing splendidly at solving the problem of poverty, yeah. such that in 20 years there won't be poverty, then why get exercised about giving money to people to save them from poverty? Because that's, that's in hand. Well, so you might, have, you might think they're suffering today is either relevant in itself or will have some other effect on the world, independent of poverty. Like maybe it will cause the world to be worse in some way and we can prevent that badness yeah. or we can prevent that suffering. I mean, we but might invest, we might put more resources into solving poverty and do it a little bit faster at the expense of um, developing technologies that will save us from an existential threat. You sure, know? so there's definitely trade-offs that one is making independent of this like now versus later trade-off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess this is a complicated question and I assume we could easily spend an hour discussing just this question. Um, if I want to express my views on it, uh, the thing I would say is that I don't think if I was giving money 200 years ago, like I would not prefer have 1% of world um, gross product to give 200 years ago than to give today. Like I think people were poor 200 years ago, but really I'm happier to be a philanthropist with my share of the world today than I would have been 200 years ago. I don't really know, it may be that now is the optimal time for giving. Like it's been getting, I think it's probably been getting better over recent history, and maybe it'll start to decline. I just think we don't really have strong grounds to suspect like 
Thanks for your one or the other. We don't have strong grounds for suspecting that philanthropy will continue to grow with wealth. Uh, I don't know. I don't actually know what the evidence is on that. But in any case, you ask us to nominate a path to win yeah. down, right? We have a few votes for left. Left is? Left is do better things exist, or do things that are knowably better, substantially better exist. I vote for right. Then the I vote for right. potential future. Yeah. Oh, dear. OK, that's a tie break. <laughs> oh, right, right. 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 right, right, right. It looks like it's a strong vote for the right. Well, room for libertarians, of course, it's a strong vote for the right. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Pretty well, pretty, pretty split on that ideological axis. I guess this claim is that if we invest on the order of hundred million dollars, we should expect to have a substantially better sense of what the best things to do are um, than we currently do. So, supposing that there actually exist knowably substantially better things to do, we will have a better sense of them. And so, here are a couple arguments to make in favor. This time, it's going to be each of these independently supports the conclusion, sort of barring all of them. So. One claim is that the total amount of money that's been invested so far is, or appears to be under $100 million. So I think $100 million would be large compared to the explicit investment in cause prioritization to date. I think the research to date does not seem to have been fruitless. That is, if I could pay $100 million and move from our state of knowledge 20 years ago to our state of knowledge today, I'd be pretty pleased with that. A second argument is that um, even failing completely, if you did so in a way where your method was quite transparent and other people saw what you had done and how you had tried to do it, would be substantial progress from our current state of affairs. So if one were to fail completely, one would still be able to say, like, this way lies danger, the next people to come should not go this way. This is not something on which we can make progress. I think it's, in some sense, very difficult for us to not change our epistemic status as we invest in this area, just because at the moment it seems like we know so little about it. We don't see, like, a bunch of bones of people who've gone this way and failed. Yeah. <laughs> um, at least I don't think we do. So if we do, that would be great to know. And other people should mention it. Yeah, like development studies is littered with failures <laughs> along the way, and there's lots of study of why certain development interventions fail. The problem is they disagree on why they failed. Sure, so there's some distinction between, do you mean in terms of interventions or in terms of organizations that are attempting to evaluate or to build this understanding of the um, So talking about specific interventions because it's better to look at like specific projects rather than like the organization itself because they're much sure. different from different projects. Yeah, so I think that is a, I was seeing this as a distinction here, right? If we look at particular projects, we can see lots of efforts to like, you know, improve health in the developing world that have failed. Yeah. We can point to a huge number of them. Yeah. If we look at like transparent efforts to improve our understanding of what factors, like serious transparent efforts to improve our understanding of what factors really matter in the long run, then we see fewer efforts. Like I can't point to any organization like GiveWell, it was like chugging along like GiveWell, and then just invested $20 million and didn't accomplish anything. Okay, sure, yeah, not in that kind of sense, sure, sorry. Yeah, so I think that, to me, that's something that makes this area more attractive, right? If I looked and I saw a bunch of people who had tried and invested tens of millions of dollars and hadn't gotten anywhere, um, I would be much more hesitant uh, to give my next dollar to such a cause. Um, the third argument is that I think we can just see, if we look right now at research programs on the table, that they look promising in particular. Um, you mean like GiveWell? For example, GiveWell Labs looks pretty promising to me. Right. If I look at GiveWell Labs, I'm quite happy to invest in it. But even like the IARPA project, I'm quite happy to invest in it compared to um, interventions in the developing world. I'd be quite you, happy to hand tell on something. Could you repeat the first one? Because I'm. Um, I was claiming the total budget so far have been not so large, at less than $100 million on very explicit projects, and that their output doesn't seem to have been, um, like they didn't fail. Right. They produced useful info. Okay. And so that's a reason to expect that um, increasing the funding to $100 million will increase the amount of benefits. Yeah. yeah. So we're far from saturating, basically. Yeah. And this yeah. one in particular tell you that, but at least, yeah. But sort of the scale involved, the amount of must money invested so far has been fairly small. Okay. Um, yeah, I can just go through these randomly. We can cover all of them. Uh, okay, so claim one was that uh, even complete failure would be valuable. I observed that as far as I know, there aren't transparent, credible failures in this area. It would be great to know if there were. I'd be very interested in that. Um, and then part two is that if there were transparent, credible failures, it would really help in the future. That is, future efforts would be better directed not only in solving the same problem, but also in performing object level interventions. Um,
Second claim is the total budgets have been pretty small and there actually has been progress. So one can just look. I guess here the main question when you want to claim the total budgets are small is, in, is your inventory of people doing explicit research actually exhausted? Um, that's something that's very hard to be sure of. But if you know, I sat down, um, we've talked a bit to people, at, like you know, for these organizations, what do they see as the main people doing research in this space? How does the total investment there, like how much money has it been? It looks like it has not been that much money. I can't offer any evidence that my taxonomy. Can doesn't. you just present quickly what you think the progress today has been? Like who's done what? Is, yeah. it, is that five billion to date, or is like the future of humanity in particular? Is that correct? That's to date. All those numbers are to date. Okay. So I guess this is also the number for Google is perhaps a bit old. All the numbers are a bit old, um, and so they've changed a little bit, uh, but not much. Hmm? Zoom in. Oh, here. These are three random examples from that list of six I gave before. I would give similar numbers for the other organizations there. So that's a long way short of 100 million. Uh, certainly for each organization, though, as you add them up, you get up to yeah. on the order of 100 million. So when you say that, that it's been far from fruitless, is that saying indirectly that the work done by those two organizations has been heeded by by philanthropic foundations. So to make the argument I want to make run, um, what I want to argue is that we actually have increased our understanding of what's going on. I think it's also the case that uh, it has been heated by some donors. But I think it being heated is a separate question, and that's where you might want to so it is evident. in marketing and so on, and mm -hmm. you know lobbying and that sort of thing, rather than expecting these organizations themselves to specialize in that. So the main relevance of whether it's been heated is like, as evidence about whether the research has really been in some sense improving in our understanding. Right? So I think GiveWell is by far the easiest example to point to to say that our knowledge has improved. And that's just because GiveWell has produced very concrete recommendations that have moved reasonably large amounts of money and which I think are like, knowably, it's not clear they're knowably superior to things normal philanthropists invest in, but they're like, reliably based on a firmer sort of footing. Um, so I think that's one easy thing to point to. Uh, another class of things to point to are cost-benefit analyses. Um, so I guess if I count all cost-benefit analyses, I'm going to get into a slightly larger amount of money. Uh, but as a society, we've now done a reasonably large number of cost-benefit analyses. In particular, we can look at like DCP2 uh, for something of a slightly different flavor. We can look at the Copenhagen consensus, where they've accumulated or gathered together a number of considerations that are relevant to evaluating the impact of a cause, um, have actually run that calculation, and have contributed to this like, growing library of interventions for which we have some estimate of its effectiveness. At the same time, we've also developed a better understanding of the ways in which those estimates are limited. So sort of, even if you think that what we've discovered is those estimates aren't great, we're really in a much better place epistemically than we were prior to doing them. Right now we're in a situation where we have estimates on the table. We can say, here are the plausible, here are the likely flaws with those estimates. Um, yeah. And that's a lot more to know than nothing. Uh, I think the idea of uh, looking to the future, the idea that existential risk is important on aggregated utilitarian grounds and the far future matters is an interesting, important idea, which justifies a reasonable amount of investment in thinking these things through. It's not clear if that idea ought to be directly relevant to what you do, but I think it is clear that if you haven't sort of thought those things through, then you have more thinking to do. Um, I don't know if we want to get into a discussion of that here. I think we'll probably avoid it, but I'm happy to talk about it um, offline. I think we've built up a sort of library of important relevant considerations. So there's just a large number of writings about issues that have come up when trying to evaluate causes. Uh, and here I could get into, yeah. yeah. Could you give a couple of examples? Of an inventory of considerations that have come up when trying to evaluate. The considerations that are in the inventory. Yeah. Uh, so I guess a uh, random issue is like what discount rates ought to use with respect to evaluating giving opportunities. What discount rate should you use? Is that a question to me? Uh, I think you should discount roughly at growth rates. But like this is something where you can do a lot of thinking about it, and you know, people have done a lot of thinking about it. Um, so there's, this is a case where there's some research in academia addressing the question. That, but that's an economic term, right? Discount rates? Yeah. Yeah. Do you mean we should discount at growth rates of wealth? Uh, or population? I mean more size of the world than population. Size Total size of the world. The size of the world is not me, or what? Huh? <laughs> so if you're considering intervening on some property of interest, like if you're considering an intervention that creates economic value, I think the way to discount that intervention is by economic growth. 
Yeah. If you're considering an intervention that changes the population of the world, the way to discount in that intervention is population growth rates. Okay. Um, I think that's something that we've now done some thinking through. You know, it's not a huge issue, but there's a lot of small issues of this form. Um, okay. So probably I would say that sort of everything that people talk about in the context of effective altruism was produced at some point by a process like this one, where like the total amount of money involved in building up that knowledge was not super large. Um, so there's another question, do you think the effective altruist community as a group has actually built up useful knowledge? And maybe that's a large discussion, maybe that's really the key issue in this argument, in which case I'm happy to go into it at much greater depth, like yeah. perhaps over dinner, and I think we're running out of time. But That is a crucial question, isn't it? No, but it's but it's a standard <laughs> investment question. Yeah. Before you invest in any firm or course, you, you want to have some warrant to believe the investment will repay itself. Yeah, and so an obvious question there is to what extent have we created value so far as an indicator for to what extent we'll create value in the future. Um, I think, for example, for each of the six organizations that I listed at the beginning of this exercise, it's very easy to point to things they've done that have justified all the investment in those organizations. Um, I think that's really not not challenging at all. Um, An interesting yeah. question with the discount rates is how you should apply them to this kind of research when you're talking about the, you know choosing how to choose where to get money. Um, it seems like there may be a significantly dis different discount rate there, depending on how fast you think those opportunities are going to be changing. Yeah. Um, that research might become useless within you know a decade or so. Uh, that's right. So you might think in particular people are becoming more reasonable over time that the premium on reasonableness is dropping with each passing year and so being reasonable in the future is not so hot compared to being kind of reasonable now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a prospect. That's a possibility. I think before one even gets into that consideration, there's this ask issue like what is sort of the natural discount rate just on having a dollar to spend in 10 years? And there I think it's easier to say that it's going to look something like um, growth in... Most specifically something like GiveWell's research probably has a lifetime of, you know, a year or two of being useful. Um, ah, so I guess it depends on which part of their research. Yeah. So, like in GiveWell Labs, I would guess the lifetime is somewhat longer. But, but yeah, a lot of the concrete recommendations they produce, which is sort of their prime research output. Um, yeah, so I guess actually there's this important distinction. I'm not sure how much people in this room have followed what GiveWell is doing or are aware of what GiveWell is doing. Um, GiveWell at this point is divided into two arms, one of which is traditional GiveWell recommendations, where they recommend charities primarily in developing world health, because that's where it's easiest to get the, a very verifiable bang for your buck. And the other arm is GiveWell Labs, which is taking up some significant fraction of staff time now. And this is just, right now what they're doing is looking at a bunch of very broad causes, for example, intervening on climate change, um, criminal justice reform, labor mobility, and looking into those causes and trying to understand broadly how um, promising investment in those causes is. So when I talk about GiveWell in the course of this talk, I'm actually mostly referring to the second group. The second arm, GiveWell Labs. Um, and this is not related, really, or not yet directly related to the charity recommendations they issue and that you might be most familiar with. I guess I should have made that distinction earlier. So, in your argument, are you just basically arguing for total research development and essentially ignoring any other kind of. Uh, I'm arguing on the current margin, I think it's better to spend on research and to spend on direct work insofar as it's useful to developing an understanding of that direct work and of. Uh, sort of the broader area that the work is part of. Right, so what would you say the margin is? Like how large is the margin? Or for how many dollars would I say this keeps being the case? Essentially like, yeah. Uh, I don't know, so more than tens of millions of dollars. How much more than tens of millions of dollars? I think you have to reevaluate this argument after you've invested tens of millions more dollars explicitly. So I would not feel comfortable giving like a billion dollars to such this work right, right. now. Yeah. So, for example, if I have a thousand dollars now, you, it would, you, your argument would say it'd be better to not give it directly to like against malaria foundation because they don't necessarily that money would necessarily go into the direct like work that would be necessary that would support. So, I would argue that once you give it to the against malaria foundation, only if you believe that giving to the against malaria foundation is an effective way to like the most cost-effective way to build your understanding of what things to give to in the future. Yeah, but that yeah. might also might be like enough money that they already have to... Yeah, I would guess giving to developing... So I don't give to developing world health interventions for this reason at the moment. I think they're less effective than developing a better understanding of what to give to. At the moment, I don't think developing health interventions or developing world health interventions are the most cost-effective way to improve our understanding of what to give to. It's not just the developing world. I mean, we've wasted egregious amounts of money on health and welfare in oh, yeah. so I, Western democracies. I definitely... I also don't donate to welfare charities in the um, yeah. developed world so, so for more basic reasons. 
Would you argue reallocate funds that are already being spent on uh, stuff like AMF? So for the reasons we mentioned earlier, it's a little like the question of moving funding away from more revisions right. and expecting habit is quite a bit different than the question of, or not quite a bit, but it's, it's less likely to be a good idea than not giving more money. Um, so you're just more concerned about allocating new funds than reallocating anything else that's already being donated? Ooh, this is also a more uncomfortable question, but I think in general, for many charities, I would be happy allocating funds away from those charities to either research or the object level causes that I thought were most likely to be, provide useful information. If, if you could, which you can't. So I can't, was, so it's not an important. It is both yeah. a somewhat offensive thing to say and not a thing that's on the <laughs> table, which is why I don't normally um, mention it. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, or comment. with that algorithm of you learning gives, if it helps you know what to give to in the future, when does that cross over to actually giving to a cause? Yeah, so one thing that we didn't get into here was like, or we discussed a bit was, what is this discount rate over time? Or there's some opportunity cost of not giving now, and there's some benefit of having a better understanding in the future. So at some point, at least if you're evaluating correctly, there's a crossover where the costs of waiting exceed the value of the information you've gained. I think there's a good prima facie argument to be made that at that point, your total investment in figuring out what to do will have been a reasonable fraction of the total your, all your investment. Right? So if you've invested 0.1% of your money in figuring out what to do, I think it's very likely prima facie, the best thing to do is to invest more than that. But as the fraction you've invested in figuring out what to do grows, that prima facie argument becomes weaker, and also the, the actual like, concrete analysis of how good, it, how good it's likely to be to donate to research um, gets less favorable. I think I would, like I said, I think I'd not be super comfortable committing very large amounts of money to research of this kind at the moment because there's not really a strong argument that very large amounts of money are likely to be helpful. And then as you gave smaller amounts of money, the game would always be to reevaluate how good you how good you thought the next dollars were likely to be. So, do you think it's better to give increments than large sums, essentially? Uh, Provided more people are doing. <laughs> well, yeah, because like you said, with presentation returns, essentially you kind of need to give increments. You can't give them a large sum. Um, so I mean, this would depend. If I had a big pot of money to give, I think I would. It's very unlikely I would give all that money very early because each time you give some money, you learn something. Or like, right. I think it's if you buy this argument, the point of giving the money will in large part be to learn things. Right. So incremental donations in return are going to be more effective. Yeah, although you can't take it to the limit of very small donations because then this issue of like. You're learning, getting knowledge is useful, and waiting is unuseful, and so you have to balance these two considerations. Yeah, the money scale there is absolute, so it's like, you know, reevaluate up to $10 million, but if you're not, if you're not going to have $1,000 to give, don't worry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, $1,000. Yeah. That's basically right. Yeah. Paul, you've given us a fantastic framework with which we can compare and prioritize the causes that we think we care the most about, or what we want to learn the most about. Um, could you potentially summarize what you think the priorities are in order that we should be considering? Uh, you mean, if I were to do research in figuring out what things are, or in understanding which direct philanthropic investments are most useful, what would my current best guesses be? Where would I start? Uh, so personally, the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment is understanding technological progress, and in particular, development of like, algorithmic progress and artificial intelligence. I think these things, the impact these things are likely to have on the world is quite large compared to current investment in them. So I think, again, prime of you'd expect that there's likely to be some, a good amount of bang for your buck. I also think that people haven't done that much serious thinking about the likely impacts. There's a lot of room to think more, develop better understanding, and then based on the understanding, evaluate whether more investment is a good idea. Um, is that specifically for you, because you have the right knowledge and expertise to think about that, or is that could be generalized for other people? I think the argument is definitely strongest for me, yeah. and I think like I'm also motive like and my motive reasoning around this topic is particularly likely to be motivated based on it being an area where of expertise. What, what um, makes that investment philanthropic as distinct from industrial or economic? Ah, so it's just like two different motives that can operate here. Right, one is to create value which you can then capture. So in particular, that means that it will be value that accrues to people who are alive right now who have money to pay you, and the other would be just to do things that you think are good for um, social welfare which might involve creating value for people who can't pay you for it. So often that's people who are too poor to pay you much for it. It could also mean people in the future who aren't around to pay you. 
I think this is particularly important in this case of technological progress, where technological progress has large effects on people who will be around in the future, but most of the gains that are produced or most of the profit you can um, capture is going to come from benefits for people who are around today. So this creates some wedge between what I would do if I were philanthropically investing in technology and what I would do if I were um, in, in industry investing in technology. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we'll break for dinner now. That sounds um, good to me. Eat something, continue talking, continue talking after dinner. And uh, thank you, Paul, yeah. for a fantastic presentation. <laughs>